When Saab was first given the go-ahead to design the Gripen, Saab engineers suddenly found themselves in the middle of an incredibly complex program. The Swedish Air Force requirement was contradictory because they wanted two different planes for air combat and attack, and when a single platform was authorized, they just combined the two specifications. There were constraints in terms of size, weight and cost, imposed by the politics and the operating conditions. There was the pressure to keep up with foreign technology like the F-15 or the F-16 in the United States and the MiG-29 and Sukhoi-27 in the Soviet Union. The aircraft being produced was expected to be a staple of Swedish defense, an effective contender for export orders for many decades, and nobody really knew how the future looked like. Finally, at technical level, there was a disagreement on how to better proceed to strike the right balance in all these areas. In one area only, there was agreement. The main elements that make or break the success of a plane, aerodynamics, structure and propulsion, had to work together in synergy, trying to perform above the sum of the single part. Sub-engineers had to take some tough decisions that if proven incorrect down the line, could have placed the whole program at risk of cancellation. This is the story of how and why they did it. Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. Please stay with me till the end, because the stuff that we discuss here are hard to find on YouTube. This is the first of a series of videos where we shall try to examine in reasonable detail the technical choices made during the development of the Gripen. This material is the result of the aggregation of various public domain sources in different languages. It will be a rather technical series and if you don't know what I'm talking about, feel free to ask in the comments below. Saab already had decades of experience in Delta Canard layouts acquired with the Vigan program, so it was a natural choice considering also that so many projects in Europe were taking the same approach. There is a video discussing the reason for this in detail if you are interested. At the time, however, the advantages of Delta Canard were not clear to everybody, and a fundamental element of the equation that fly-by-wire controls was not a fully mature technology yet. Yes, because the Delta Canard can give its best in terms of maneuverability and low drag when the plane is intrinsically unstable. And since no pilot can really fly an unstable plane safely, some form of help was needed under the form of a computer controlling the commands. The Gripen configuration was chosen to be unstable, with the center of gravity placed about 10% of the aerodynamic mean cord aft of the aerodynamic center. Possibly the major drawback of Delta Canard is the fact that the stall is always asymmetric with an abrupt change of behavior when the vortices above the wing burst above the stall angle of attack. In pilot's parlance, modern Delta Canards are sometimes said to stall first in roll or yo rather than in pitch. So the flight control system had to take care of these situations too to avoid irrecoverable plane departures from control flight. And this was no small feat. The choice of placing the center of gravity in a relatively back position alone disclosed more freedom in placing the internals and the engine in a configuration that did not interfere with the area rules blending of the fuselage 
essential to minimize the wave drag. The fact that there was no tail interfering with the area rule also meant that the wing could be placed relatively forward and the tail cone could be accurately designed to minimize drag. Obviously, the position of the center of gravity and the aerodynamic center changes with the flight conditions. The aerodynamic center at transonic and supersonic speed tend to move backward to an extent such that the gripen at supersonic speed becomes neutrally stable or even marginally stable. The center of gravity changes with the fuel levels and the release of external load. Extreme care was placed to limit the excursion of the center of gravity, which is not superior to 5% of the mean aerodynamic cord of the wing. In fact, the plan has shown to be remarkably insensitive to variation of the external stores and fuel load up to 50% of the maximum takeoff weight. The gripen and pitch always handles in the same way and it needs very little trim. The close coupled position of the canards quite close to the main wing has a beneficial effect. In fact, the vortices generated by the canards reinforce the main vortices generated by the delta wing and this in turn allows very, very high instantaneous turn rates at high angle of attack. More importantly, the canards are trimmed automatically by the flight computer to optimize the lift to drag ratio for every position of the aerodynamic center, the center of gravity and, and the angle of attack. The gripen is always flying at the optimal efficiency something that is not achievable without a computer control flight system. The design of this configuration required thousands and thousands of hours in the wind tunnel where systematically different configurations were tested till the optimum compromise was identified. The engineers were able to obtain a lift-to-drag ratio of 9 better than all previous Saab fighters. At the end, the aerodynamic configuration of the Gripen was satisfactory, but the next step was going to be the most important. Was this configuration capable of supporting the qualities required for combat? Would it be capable of pointing the nose in the right direction? Would it be easy to recover after departure? All of this will be the subject of the next video. While the Gripen was being developed, there was a lot of interest for high angle of attack performance. Since air-to-air -air combat seems to end up like a classic dogfight in many occasions, energy and speed decreased and high angle of attack ensued. Many early supersonic fighters had a tendency to stall out of the sky when entering this region of the flight envelope. To the dismay of the pilots, as recovery was often difficult, if not impossible. The Vegan had a rather benign high angle of attack characteristics, thanks to the Knard layout, something different from some uh, contemporary aft tail foreign fighters. It tended to bleed a lot of energy, like every Delta, uh, high angle of attack, but it was relatively safe for the pilot. So this was also an important element in favor of the grip and Knard layout. In the Gripen specification, the spin recovery capability was explicitly mentioned as an important requisite, supplemented by a spin prevention system that had to prevent a departure to happen. Basically, it had to be a belt and braces approach. Spin recovery depends heavily from the various elements of the plane not casting an aerodynamic shadow on the control surfaces, particularly on the vertical rudder. This issue can be tested in vertical wind tunnels at an early stage, making sure that the design fits with the requirement. The weapon configuration obviously was tested and the actual test on the prototypes confirmed the good behavior. The spin prevention system was built into the flight control system because, well, it seemed the logical thing to do since it was already controlling all the aspects of the flight. Everything seemed fine till the 8th of August 
1993. A production but not yet in service Gripen crashed during a low speed maneuver during an air show in Stockholm. The investigation concluded that the plane had been a victim of a pilot induced oscillations, something that also caused the loss of the first prototype four years before and it appeared to have been resolved. U and roll stability at high angle of attack is strongly dependent on canard incidents and the investigation concluded that the plane became unstable with canard deflection in the region of minus 10 to minus 25 degrees. The fix was to adopt small positive values of canard deflection. Quite a radical change. This turned out to be beneficial as it meant that the trading edge surfaces were positive, that is, rear and down, thus giving more positive lift. But now it was realized that in some conditions a physical geometrical limitation to the elevons might be encountered, which could cause loss of control. A low speed wind tunnel program was immediately set up. And for the first time, the large low speed wind tunnel electrical fans that normally were used only to provide discrete incident changes to well, simplify the operations, were now deflected continuously during the test run. So after the test, they came to a non-software fix. It was a pair of small strakes behind the canal surfaces. And this type of vortex generator serving the purpose of directional and lateral stability enhancement at high angles of attack is not uncommon on fighters. The Eurofighter and the Mirage 2000, for example, have them. Also, a new canard trim control law could now be introduced to eliminate the risk of the control surfaces hitting the end of their travel. However, this test surfaced another potential issue, the aerodynamic hysteresis of the wing plus canards combination. Hysteresis is a phenomenon affecting many different physical systems it means that the state of a system might depend from how the system is changing. In this specific case, it means that if I am increasing the angle of attack, the wing will stall at a limit angle, but the flow will reattach at a lower angle if I am decreasing. Its best public known practical application may well be the spectacular aerobatic display performed by the test pilot uh, Viktor Pugachev in a Sukhoi Su-27 known as the Cobra. The presence of a hysteresis was actually expected, but it turned out to be particularly dangerous in post-stall and stall recovery conditions. The flow did not reattach easily and it did so in an asymmetric and shaky way so the recovery might have been quite difficult if not assisted. So a large part of the testing campaign was dedicated to developing appropriate control laws and trimming the plane controls to make the recovery easy and intuitive for the pilot. And since then, finally, no further problems have been reported. In aircraft structural design, there is a number that is a starting point of every design, the load factor. The load factor is defined as lift divided by weight, and it is often measured in Gs, which is equal to the weight of the aircraft. A 1.1 Gs turn, fairly normal in commercial aviation, means that the lift is 10% higher than the weight. The higher the lift, the tighter is the turn, all else being equal. The 4th and 4.5 generation fighters have mostly been designed to pull up to 9 Gs in order to outfight the opponent in an air combat engagement. For the previous generation of fighters like the Vigan, 7 to 8 G was the rule. The same generation has been designed for longer service lives, 
typically by a factor of two or even more, going up from 1800 to 2100 hours for the Vigan to 4000 or 6000 hours for the generation 4.5. So the demand on the structural engineers to keep the aircraft together have certainly not decreased. Carbon fiber composites seem to offer a way out for all the tough demands put up on the new fighter in the early 80s. In-house research at Saab and by outside partners in this field had been running for more than a decade. So the type of material was considered mature enough at the time of the grip and preliminary design. The carbon fiber composite proved itself to be a high strength construction material of low weight but with higher costs compared to conventional aluminum designs. The Grippen's delta wing offers a light but strong and stiff structure in conjunction with the use of carbon fiber on the outside skins and main spars, even when the relative thickness of the wing is small. The problem of stiffness is vital, as the single spar aluminum winch Wigan had shown years before. If a wing is not stiff enough, aileron reversal may occur, and if this happens while rolling at low altitude, it may be fatal. Saab, at the time, was wise enough to tackle the problem by creating a mixed development group composed with aerodynamics designers and structural engineers. Flight mechanics simulations very early in the project had established the required minimum values for the flex to rigid ratio of the rolling moment to the aileron deflection for meeting the very stringent supersonic roll rate demands. The wing carbon fiber structure designed with the help of British Aerospace turned out to be fully up to the expectations. So the grip and wing is a multi-spar single upper and lower skin design with three fuselage main fittings blended into a mid-wing body position. A delta wing also offers a fairly large volume for fuel and has in general good static and dynamic aeroelastic properties, even with large external stores on the wing pylons. Careful error ruling was adhered to during the design phase and the cooperation between aerodynamicists and airframe design engineers was always very close. An example was the front fuselage that was circular in shape initially, but it was redesigned with an elliptical geometry. Significant gains in wave drag and also high angle of attack behavior were achieved at the cost of increasing the manufacturing costs. Obviously, not everything went well the first time. Early into the design phase, an alum over rising supersonic drag became strong enough. An optimistic goal of a 25% reduction was identified. A significant reduction of the maximum cross-section area and a corresponding lengthening of the fuselage to increase the slenderness ratio was found beneficial, but this meant redesigning a very large portion of the aircraft structure. During subsequent development, the goal could not be fully realized as compromises always have to be made in the design process. However, early flight testing confirmed that the drag reduction predictions were met and the long tail cone became one of the Gripen's landmark features. Improvements in jet engine technology have, to a large extent, been the driving force for the market increase of capability for every new generation of fighter aircraft. What is meant by capability, though, is hard to define exactly. Well, speed has not increased since the 60s or the 70s, and the demand for that, which for half a century was so dominating, seemed to have disappeared in the 90s. Versatility, instead, has taken the front row. Generation 4 and 4.5 fighters are usually designed to be well-balanced aircraft, either large or small, but capable of fulfilling a wide range of missions. There is no need to explain why the selection of the engine is one of the key points in designing a combat aircraft. Oh, 
Saab already had a rather problematic experience with the engine chosen for the Viggen, which had its share of problems, to be honest. Being a civilian engine turned into a military-grade engine, it had the tendency to incurring into severe surging at large angle of attack. Angles not normally operated by airliners. And this could cause the complete loss of the aircraft. The problem was eventually fixed, but not without costly engine and intake modifications. Although powerful in afterburner mode and with low specific fuel consumption uh, because of high bypass ratio, it did not possess a key quality for a military engine. A military engine must be 100% reliable, particularly in the hands of a hard-fisted combat pilot fully occupied with his tasks. For Saab, the 100% military General Electric F404 engine represented the natural answer for a lightweight fighter propulsion unit. In fact, the Swedish company had its eyes on the American engine since its inception. It was small in size with a thrust to weight ratio of 8 and it was proven since it was already flying in the early F-18s. Actually, it was also the engine of the F-20 Tiger Shark, but that plane never took <laughs> off. <laughs> Anyhow, since the engine was not going to be in a twin configuration like on the F-18, some more thrust was required. The version that Volvo manufactured under license with the designation RM12 had a maximum thrust increased to 80 kN, up from the 71 kN thrust in the US Navy version. The TF404 turned out to be very satisfactory. Other than having a good thrust to weight ratio and an acceptable specific fuel consumption, it proved itself to be remarkably insensitive to the angle of attack or side slip. Inlet guide vanes, modified by Volvo, turn out to be very effective and engine surges are extremely rare and easily recoverable. In the Gripen, the engine is placed at the fuselage rear end, well behind the usual location. Something that was not possible on previous Saab fighters like the Draken or the Viggen, since the resulting longitudinal instability otherwise would have been unacceptable for the pilot. Those aircraft had their internals arranged to have the engine close to the center of gravity, occupying valuable room in the mid-fuselage region. The group and unstable design allowed for the position of the center of gravity to be behind the aerodynamic center of the wing. Internal space was freed from the engine and it was used to house the main landing gear, for example, and some other fuel tanks and any kind of equipment. As we have seen in another video, this allowed to design a smooth tail cone that greatly reduces the drag of the fuselage and it is one of the Gripen's landmark features. All the Swedish fighters require short takeoff and landing performances. Since they are dispersed in makeshift airstrips often derived from roads, they need to take off and land in very confined spaces. This requirement is often satisfied by aerodynamic means, but the propulsion design may be involved too. In fact, the Viggen had pioneered the use of thrust reversal 
in a military fighter. But it turned out to be a not so ideal solution, to be honest. It added weight and increased the weight drag because it was making the fuselage rather stubby at the rear end. It was also complex and it turned out to be dangerous to tune because it caused at least one aircraft loss after touchdown because of an asymmetrical reverse thrust. For the Gripen, thrust reversal was actually considered, but it turned out, luckily, not to be necessary. Even if, even if the field performance requirements were only mildly relaxed if compared to its predecessor. This was accomplished through a higher thrust to weight ratio at takeoff and higher trim and lift coefficient at landing, despite the fact that the angle of attack at the approach is 1.5 degree less than the Vigan. The Gripen was also given an automatic landing mode, triggered by the nose wheel contact with the ground. When it is engaged, it plants a large deflection of the canard, uh, of the elevons and the air brakes. Together with the brakes on the landing gear, it can stop the plane in a very short space. This is the last video about the grip and design. I hope I have given you some sketches of the elements considered during the design of a modern fighter. I am conscious it wasn't particularly entertaining, but it wasn't meant to be. I wanted to give a window on the actual work behind modern combat aviation. It is not as cool as aerobatics or shooting weapons, but it is the background that makes everything possible. If you like this video, I am sure you will be interested in the videos that are going to appear beside me. In the meanwhile, please like, dislike, subscribe and hit the bell so you won't miss anything in the future. And if you could consider supporting the channel on Subscribestar or Patreon, that would be amazing. In the meanwhile, thank you very much for watching, stay safe and see you next time.